What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, philosophers alive before Christ, walked the earth and asked, what is truth? And every generation of people since then have sought its answer. In today's society, we want reality, we want quality, we look for authenticity and reliability. Yet so often we get lost in the mire of what society tells us to believe, what society tells us is truth much of which is based off an emotional justification or reasoning. Even the modern church and those proclaiming the name of Christ are distracted by a sentimental gospel focused on merely being a good person and morals that have no foundation on who the person of Christ is as our savior rather than a mere life coach. John 15 asks and answers, what is the nature of true Christianity? What marks a true disciple? How do we distinguish true Christians from false Christians? How are we to understand and actually explain our actual relationship to God through Christ? So open your Bible as we continue in the book of John. I have been really startled, I think, uh, to see a strange paradox in our present time. Christianity is under assault. I think we all know that. Um, Christians are being persecuted. The Bible is being marginalized, uh, put out of the public square. But at the same time that the church is being marginalized, the Bible being marginalized, Christians being persecuted, it is interesting that it's become popular among worldly and sinful people to claim to be Christians. It just amazes me. And even to claim to be evangelicals, athletes, um, actors, politicians, TV personalities, reality figures, all kinds of people that are very public claim to be Christians while their lives and conduct bear no resemblance to what is Christian. They seem to have little regard for God or, or Christ in terms of a dominating role in their lives, little regard for the Bible in terms of obeying its commands and living under its principles, and yet it's popular to say you're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a very strange thing. It is actually dangerous to be a true Christian, but cool to be a false one. That thought takes us to our text in John 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in Me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from Me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in Me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be My disciples. Just as the Father has loved Me, I have also loved you. Abide in My love. If you keep My commandments, you will abide in Me, that you will abide in My love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full." 
Now the questions that are answered in this text are these. What is the nature of true Christianity? What marks a true disciple? How do we distinguish true Christians from false Christians? How are we to understand and explain our actual relationship to God through Jesus Christ? These are foundational questions, foundational, the most foundational questions of all questions. There are obviously many who say they believe in Jesus, even call Him Lord, even go to church. They might like the Bible. But Jesus warned about superficial faith. In Matthew 7, He said, "'Many will say to Me in the judgment day, Lord, Lord, we did this and that in Your name, and I will say to them, Depart from Me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you.'" As we come to chapter 15, the Lord has been saying many things that night to His disciples, many things since Judas left, many wonderful promises He has given to them and to us, many warnings. He has told them about what will come. He has made pledges to them. He has described what they should expect of hostility and persecution in the future, and that goes for all of us after them. He said a lot. But here in chapter 15, we have this definitive statement about distinguishing a Judas branch from a true branch, a false disciple from a true disciple, a false Christian from a true Christian. He does it with this analogy of a, a vine and branches. There are two kinds of branches. There are fruitful branches, true believers like the eleven who remain, and fruitless branches like Judas who left. Now that Judas is gone, our Lord speaks in verse 4, and that's where we want to pick it up, to the remaining eleven and to all others who, uh, who are still claiming to be followers of Christ. Abide in Me. That's the command. The word is remain, stay. Don't do what Judas did. Don't leave. Don't go out. Stay. Remain. This is a simple command, but it really dominates the rest of this text. The word abide is used ten times. Stay. Stay. I would simply echo that to you. If you have made a profession of faith in Christ, if you have attached to Christ, at least from the human perspective, from what we can see and experience, don't leave. Stay. Stay. Give evidence that your faith is real. Stay. If you leave, you demonstrate that you are a fruitless branch never had eternal life and will be cut off, dried up, and burned. Go back to verse 4. The first promise is salvation, eternal life. That is contained in His words, I in you. Abide in Me, remain, stay, and I in you. That is how you define what it means to be a Christian. It is to be indwelt by God, indwelt by God. Down in verse 5 He says the same thing. He who abides in Me and I in Him. We become, as Peter says, partakers of the divine nature. So we remind you that when you describe yourself and say, I'm a Christian, and somebody says, what does that mean? It, it is far more than that you believe certain things or that you go certain places or go through certain religious ceremonies. It means that the Trinity lives in you. God has taken up residence in you. You are His dwelling place. You are His temple. That's salvation. You're a new creation because you became a partaker of the divine nature. You are presently the possessor of the very life of God which is as eternal as God is. You will never die. You will only go into eternal glory. Another way to understand that is your salvation was a bigger change than your resurrection because you were given the divine nature. You're only awaiting the fullness of its expression. That's salvation. So the first thing that comes to one who abides is salvation. 
The second thing is righteousness or sanctification, if you will. Sanctification. Verse 4 again, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in Me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Me and I in Him, he bears much fruit, for apart from Me you can do nothing. Using the agricultural metaphor, a a branch lying on the ground isn't going to bear any fruit because the fruit comes up from the root through the vine and extends out the branches. If you are connected, however, you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. You will bear, according to verse 5, much fruit. And what is this righteous fruit? Well, we went over it last time. Repentance for sin, Uh, a true repentance and a lifelong repentance. That's righteous fruit. John the Baptist said that. Holy attitudes, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Praise and worship, the fruit of our lips, even praise to God. Giving to people's need, Philippians 4, Romans 15, that's fruit. Communication of truth that blesses others, that's fruit, 1 Corinthians 14. Pure conduct, Philippians 1, Colossians 1. And then finally we said, when you bring someone to the knowledge of Christ through the gospel, that is fruit. Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 16. Any righteous deed that comes as a result of a righteous nature and a righteous attitude. So what do you receive if you stay? Salvation, sanctification. Salvation, sanctification. Righteousness. Now let me take you to the third, answered prayer. Answered prayer. Look at verse 7. If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you." That is an astounding promise, is it not? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you abide in Me. There are two qualifiers here. Qualifier number one, if you abide in Me, if you are a true believer. If you are a true branch, if you have a permanent union with Jesus Christ in which His life is coming through you. Let me look at it on the other side. If you're not a true branch, you are on your own, my friend. You are on your own. God guarantees no answer to your prayers, no involvement in your life. You have no promises. You have no assurances. You can make no claims on Him. He has no obligation to you. God never promises to answer the prayer of a non-believer or a false believer. He's under no obligation to do that. If you are a Judas branch, you have no claim on Him. But if On the other hand, verse 7, you abide in Me. If you're a remaining branch, possessor of true eternal life, if you're abiding in Me, everything changes. You can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now that sounds like a carte blanche. Some people think it should be, that whatever people decide they want, uh, God should have to deliver as if He's some genie who jumps out of a bottle when they rub it and gives them whatever they want. But there's a second condition. The first condition, if you abide in Me, second condition, verse 7, and My words abide in you, and My words abide in you. Now that's not talking about the red letters in in your Bible, not talking about the actual things that Jesus said. I don't like red letter Bibles for that very reason. It's all from God. But, But that is simply saying, if the truth from God abides in you. Why does He say that? Because to be a believer, you have access to God. To be a believer, you have the promise your prayers will be answered. But also to know that your prayer is going to be answered, you have to know something about God. You have to pray within the framework of God's revelation. So Jesus says that second condition is that 
to borrow Paul's language in Colossians 3, that the, the Word of Christ dwells in you richly. You understand from Scripture who God is, what He desires. You understand who Christ is, what He desires. You understand who the Holy Spirit is and what He desires. Can you imagine without that condition if God just said, if you abide in Me, ask whatever you want and I'll do it? We would be running things. If God was simply a genie who popped out of the little bottle and gave us everything we want, we would be all on a course to self-destruction. I remind you that this is an incredible, incredible promise from the Lord that whatever you ask consistent with His person, purpose, and plan, He will do. Your, your prayer should demonstrate 2 Corinthians 10.5 that every thought has been taken captive to the obedience of Christ. You pray within the framework of divine purpose. You might even say this, Father, this I ask because this could be what You desire for Your glory. This could be what You desire for Your kingdom. This could be what You desire to exalt Your Son. This could be what You desire to show the power of Your Holy Spirit. That's the principle, always with a view to the divine name, the divine plan, the divine purpose, the divine person. A fourth blessing, if you abide, the Lord promises you assurance assurance. Verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be My disciples. The hardworking vine dresser finds his glory in the fruitful vine. The hardworking vine dresser finds his glory in the fruitful vine. I remember meeting a gentleman, a nearly 90-year-old gentleman who grows grapes up in the Central Valley. And he, he wanted to show me his operation, one of the largest grape growers in, in, in California. And uh, I thought he would take me to an office and show me whatever. I got up there, got in a pickup truck, bounced along through some ruts, and ended up ankle deep in dirt, walking down one row after another after another while he reached in and pulled out the grapes. He showed me the fruit of His labor by showing me the grapes, and He explained to me every kind of grape. He found that if I wanted to know about Him, I didn't need to see His pickup truck and I didn't need to see His office, I needed to see His fruit. And then I needed to eat it, <laughs> which was an incredibly wonderful experience. This is what the Father does. The Father is glorified when He goes down the rows of His children and when He sees the fruit. God's glory is in the display of His own fruitfulness through us. God is glorified when we bear fruit. It's like Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men. That's a different metaphor, same idea. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who's in heaven, that glory goes to God. It's as simple as this, for a believer, for a true believer, you are not the explanation for your life. You're not it. People may poke around to try to figure out why you are the way you are. There isn't a human answer. There isn't a human answer. There's no human explanation for me being who I am. I am not the explanation of my life. God in me is the explanation of my life. If there's any love in me, it is the love of Christ shed abroad in my heart. Any transcendent love beyond human love, beyond normal love, is the love of Christ shed abroad in my heart. If there's any joy in me, any unassailable joy, any joy that never is touched, any joy that transcends all earthly joys, it is the joy of Christ in me. I am not the explanation for my life. He is. Now the benefit of this, incredible benefit, 
Just an incredible benefit. Back to that same verse, verse 8, and so prove to be My disciples. The benefit is, I know I'm a believer. How do I know I'm a believer? How do I know that? Because I, I can't explain My life. I can't explain my love, I can't explain my peace, my joy, my knowledge, my wisdom, my understanding, my usefulness. I can't explain me humanly. Can't. I can't. Something is going on in me that has no explanation on a human level. So I look at my life and I have assurance that, that I am a true branch because I, I see all this fruit. So the true branch, blessed with salvation, sanctification, provision through answered prayer, and assurance. Two more. Number five, love. It's going to be quick. Love, verses 9 and 10. Our Lord says words that are familiar to us. Just as the Father has loved Me, I have also loved you. Abide in My love. If you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love, just as I have kept My Father's commandments and abide in His love." Um, for us, a statement in verse 9, abide in My love, abide in My love, stay in the place of My love. Jude put it this way, Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. What does He mean by that? Stay where you can be showered with His love. Stay where you can be showered with His love. Don't move out of the circle where His love is poured out. Well, how do you stay in that circle? How do you do that? You love Him in return. How do you demonstrate that love? Go back to 1415. If you love Me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21, chapter 14, he who has my commandments, keeps them, is the one who loves me. So it's pretty clear, and we see it again in verse 10 of chapter 15, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So how do you stay in the place where you can be lavished by divine love? Be what? Obedient. Be obedient. It's an amazing thing to live a Christian life for a long time and just live in the lavish realities that we're talking about, to have salvation, some benefits of being the age I am, to have had salvation and to see sanctification and to have answered prayer and to, and to understand that, that, I, that I am a true branch abiding in the true vine, that the Trinity lives in me because of the fruitfulness. And then to know that I have lived so many years in the, in the love of God just lavished on me. Incredible. So this is what a true branch is. This is a true believer, saved, sanctified, direct connection to God for what's on His heart, assurance, and lavished with love. There's a final benefit, blessing, and that's joy. Verse 11, joy. These things, meaning everything He's just said in previous ten verses, these things I have spoken to you so that My joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. If there's any love in Me, it's Christ's love. If there's any peace in Me, it's His peace. If there's any joy in Me, it's His joy because I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I'm saying all these things to you so that you may have My joy and that your joy may be made full. That's good news for the eleven. Listen, the Christian life is not a life of uh, rigidity, restriction, restraint, deprivation. This is not unhappy legalism. This isn't some kind of brow-beating, dour experience of gutting it out. This is living as, as, um, as the Scripture says, with joy unspeakable. A joy unspeakable, joy that can't even be articulated. He says in chapter 16, verse 22, you have grief now to them, he says, but I'll see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. All these things are permanent, a permanent salvation, a permanent sanctification, 
permanent access to the throne of God for all that is necessary, permanent assurance, permanent love, permanent joy. John picked up on that, and when he wrote his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 4, he said, I, these things I write that your joy may be full. If you have an alternative, you can turn and do what Judas did. You can walk away. Walk away from salvation, walk away from sanctification, righteousness, walk away from uh, answered prayer. You can walk away from the security and assurance of knowing you belong to the Lord. You can walk away from lavish divine love and you can walk away from everlasting joy. You can do that. You can walk away from all that being perfected in heaven and one day hearing the words of the Lord um, enter into the joy of your Lord when you enter into eternal joy. You can walk away from all of it. Judas did. Judas did. But if you walk away, there are warnings. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Then verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Jesus said way more about hell, everlasting burning in hell than He did about heaven. You can walk away. Judas did. And Jesus said He went to His own place. His own place was hell. He walked away from the presence of God, and He's there and will be there forever. That's the option. There's no middle ground. Cast into the fire and burn. We don't need to explain that. The New Testament describes hell, everlasting darkness, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, burning, remorse. Horrible place. You can make that choice. Peter obviously understood this and wrote these words. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's, he's, he's got to be thinking about Judas. They escaped defilement. I mean, they stepped out of the world, they stepped into the, the realm of Christ stepped into His world. If they've done that and they are again entangled in the defilements of the world and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Whoa. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It's like a dog returning to its vomit, a sow after washing returning to wallowing in the mire. Don't leave. Stay. All the promises are to those who remain. To take advantage of the resources available, simply visit our website at gty.org or give us a call at 888-57-GRACE. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next time on Grace to You.